generate that kind of power, these guys borrow a recipe from NASA. The strap-on boosters to the space shuttle uses the same basic propellant that we do. The main part of that is the ammonium percolate. It's real critical that everything be done absolutely correctly because there's no room for error, when we, especially in a rocket motor of this size. Anything under pressure that has any type of combustible properties to it can become dangerous, but until you put it under pressure, it's not. Loretta Gorgelik is an incredible rocketeer. Loretta builds motors. I don't know many women that ever built rocket motors. You go through a bunch of process of putting all the propellant in, you add the curities, man, it's a battle station. Once the final component is added to start the curing process, packing the propellant becomes a race against the clock. It's all hands on deck. You've got to go ahead and mix those securities for about five to seven minutes max. Then you've got to get it out of the bowl, and you've got to put it under a vacuum for about another eight minutes, and then you've got to get it mixed and packed in 10 to 15 minutes, and you want the propellant to stay soft like clay. If the putty-like fuel starts to harden too soon, they'll be left with hundreds of dollars worth of useless goo. While it's still soft, the fuel must be rammed tightly into a cardboard sleeve around a spacer tube. You know, with all this rocket science stuff we guys do, you know, you'd think we'd be able to come up with a better way of packing a propellant and beating it with a stick, you know? Once hardened, the core of solid fuel is cut into sections called grains. A grain is a round cylindrical piece of propellant, and they're all lined up like ducks in a row in a packing sleeve with a straight core that goes through it. On ignition, the grains burn simultaneously. If it works, this will ensure that the thrust created during the burn stays even and that the motor doesn't disintegrate from a surge in pressure. Okay, now we're just loading it from the top. The team has never built a motor the size of the brute that will power the Aurora and it's too big and expensive to test. The next best thing, a one-tenth scale trial version of the same design. See it? All right. See it? Yep. Here, look, let's look at the size of this. <laughs> this is 10 times what this is. Mm. 10 times Ten what times that is. 10 times as much propellant. It's time to put their chemistry to the test. But remember, these guys know what they're doing. Don't even think of trying this at home. And we're going in five, Four, three, two, one, ignition. Woo! Woo! Hey, let's get that chair back. Look at the ass. <laughs> Talk about a business end. My goodness thing. Looking at the motor, it's pretty clear how Aurora is going to get off the ground. Getting it back could be the biggest problem of all. It's almost launch time for the first competition of the week at LDRS. This rocket challenge has an interesting wrinkle to it. Most of the rockets you're seeing high and fast. In this event, it's how low can you go, still deploy a parachute, and then recover the rocket safely. Lots of very interesting entries in this event. One more rule, they have to be powered by motors generating at least 500 pounds of thrust. That's enough to push a normal rocket to the cloud. I basically got bored with normal rockets and I decided to take one of these boxes and turn it into a rocket. Today, we're going to see how low we can get that box to fly on a K-motor. There's a good variety of odd stuff in the air, which makes it more fun. Also hoping to reach a new low, the Hillbilly team returns with a makeshift rocket that proves that this crew will try to make anything fly. This is a spool, and it's going to fly under 100, 200 feet. Has it flown before? No. Oh, boy. I'm concerned that the tape is going to rip off on your, your lift, guys, and you're going to lose tape and drag the chute like, you know, 100 feet off the pad. I want to make sure that those people and those people are right over at the are next set of pad are out of the way. I've got the flight card, and literally we just need you're okay. These guys are ready. We're going to clear this area. Another competitor for low honors is out of this world by design. There's never been a rocket like this. Alien with an attitude. This is a K550. That's about all it takes. It weighs about 35, 40 pounds. It's 80 inches tall. 
Seven half inches diameter. Scary. A lot could happen. Oh, man. <laughs> it's the fun of building them, putting them together, having them go up. I don't like it. Marley Davis knows Alien will fly. Where's the Can he keep it low? And will his exotic recovery system work as planned? Okay, this is it. Alien with an attitude is going to Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Measured by dual handheld optical sights, Alien hits a max of just 191 feet. Now the arms are just again. Jack! Jack! Yeah! Woo! Both arms! Both arms! The alien has landed with attitude. Yeah, I think he broke his leg, baby, but oh, I got him off the ground. Harley Davis had a successful flight of about 190 feet with Alien with an attitude. Jim Long is ready to see if his cardboard creation can handle the sudden kick of nearly 600 horsepower. Five, four, three, two, one. Up and down, but stay together. It should have gone by now. This is not good. It's going to whistle good. Hate it when that happens. He had no parachute out, pranged, basically hits the ground and bounce. That's an automatic disqualification. So cardboard can fly, and a lot higher than anyone had anticipated. But it's a moot point, as no parachute means no good. Express mail is marked return to sender. This is bag recovery. After your rocket has come in ballistic, you need to take a bag out to pick it up, put it in. They don't like us littering their fields. That was the timer that was supposed to set off the charge. Maybe next year. Jimmy Hussey's spool may be the least airworthy thing we've seen so far. Whether it even makes it off the pad is anyone's guess. So far, I would say Jimmy Husey with about 125 feet. And then next would be Arlie Davis with about 190 feet. Those are our only two safe recovered. All right, this is exactly what we were planning to do. It had a, it was supposed to be a three second burn, and then the parachute opened perfect. Came off his patio. Yeah. <laughs> Mom doesn't know, so don't tell her. The spool tops out at 125 feet, making it the leader after three launches. But there's still one more competitor. A unique entry called Our Stinking Rocket has yet to air it out. Like the Woodstock of amateur rocketry, one farm in Argonia, Kansas has swelled to accommodate thousands of spectators watching hundreds of radical home-built rockets head for the sky. Team Extreme is prepping Aurora for flight. The body and motor tube will blast it to 30,000 feet just fine. But if they want to get it back, this thing's going to need a brain. Terry Stroud. Terry is the electronics guru of this crowd. I really admire the way he uh, comes across with his electronics, the way he, he's such an expert in that and uh, everything that goes with it. Oh, there you go. Oh. The traditional method for ejecting a parachute in a rocket is to simply build up pressure and shoot it out. In practice, that's done with black powder or gunpowder. And that's excellent, except for one problem. At 30,000 feet, there's not enough oxygen, there's not enough volume, and so when you try to go pop, you really get a fizzle. So what we decided to do is to use a CO2 ejection system. With CO2, now we have the issues of we have to make sure we get enough pressure that it doesn't come off slowly, that it comes off quickly. 